So um, we want to say thank you, Tyler and others, uh, for inviting us to be here to share our passion about estate planning, which hopefully is equal to your passion about dreaming, investing, and protecting the legacies that you guys are creating. So um, I want to introduce you to myself, which is my name is Doug Lutz, longtime resident here in Sandpoint. And then this is Michelle Newby. She's also a long, well, mostly longtime resident of Sandpoint, I'm right? Over We're 10 just not years, so I feel like that counts. Yeah, for that counts, right? Like that's right. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in the club, right? Yeah, and you'll and you'll notice as we present that she's really the brains of the operation, but we get to be a team, so it doesn't matter which brain is working. We're together, so it's a good thing. So, anyway. Um, Wanted to make one thing clear, we are estate planning consultants, we are not attorneys. Even though she's as smart as an attorney, um, we are consultants. And simply all that means is that when we meet with people, we meet with them to um, just hear and listen to them, to educate them on some things that they might need to know about estate planning, even as we will do tonight, but also to help to identify some of the concerns that they might have and how an estate plan would help them in um, establishing their legacy, whether it's investing or just, as Michelle had said, just a good way of loving their family into the future. So that's really what we are about. Now I've heard it said, and I'm sure you have too, that um, we are all here because we don't know what we don't know. How many of you people know a lot about estate planning? Great, awesome. One hand went up. Okay, very good. Michelle, Michelle can, can raise her hand all the time. So hopefully what we're gonna do is just shed a little bit of uh, light on what estate planning actually is and give you a little bit of an overview of that. Why estate planning is actually an essential part of your investment strategy as you go forward. And then the other thing that we will be sharing is are some of the documents that are part of an estate plan and how they're implemented. And then we'll go from there into, hey, what exactly is the comprehensive package that um, an estate plan is for you in your in investment strategy? And then after that, we'll just open it up to some, some questions. So let's get to the why. And I have to hit this button a couple of times and hopefully it works just fine. Why is estate planning important? Uh, there are several different reasons that we could give you, but we figured we'd land on two in particular. Two big reasons estate planning documents are essential for your overall investment plan and strategy. The first is flexibility. Um, I don't know what your personal experience is, but when I was in mortgage, I noticed that this was necessary. If in estate planning, if you can pivot quickly on something that you want to do, you want to have a document that will help you do that. Well, estate planning provides documentation that will help you to pivot. So how many of you have ever come across a hot buy and you wanted to buy it right now, but you had a partner that also had to sign or your spouse had to sign and they weren't there? Yeah. So what estate planning will do for you is allow you that flexibility so that you can actually move on a hot buy whether that person is present or not. Okay, so a second reason why estate planning is important and having the documents are essential to your investment plan is the ease of transferring bucket. So the estate plan basically provides a bucket or more than one bucket so that you can move things in and you can move things out of it, okay? And so whether it is a warranty deed that you have because you've, you've sold something and it can go out of a bucket or if you've bought something and it can go into a bucket, it gives you that opportunity to transfer with ease. And it's not just deeds, it can also be any of your assets that are titled, right? So without any further ado, uh, Michelle will talk to you about what happens when you pass away. How many of you think at some point in time you might pass away, right? The two things that are true for all of us in humanity are, right? As a human being, you will experience two things, death and taxes. We already know that, right? So anyway, so anyway Michelle's gonna talk to you about how a properly set up estate plan actually works to your advantage while you are alive and also when you pass. So go ahead, Michelle. Okay, perfect. So I hate the term estate plan. I'm just gonna put that out there. I think estate planning, more importantly, is called life planning because like Doug talked about, there's a lot of different documents that complete our estate plan that make sure that we have what we need to have to be able to achieve our goals, to be able to address our concerns, but also to be able to protect our investments and protect our loved ones. 
So I always like to start out with um, what happens here in the state of Idaho when we pass away. When the state um, finds out that we've passed away, they're going to ask two questions. The first question that they're going to ask is, did we own any real property? And it sounds like we have a lot of real property owners here in the room. <laughs> so we're going to say yes, and we're going to put a check mark in that box. The second question that the state's going to ask is about the rest of our stuff, not including the value of any property that we own, but does the rest of our stuff equal $100,000 or more? So we'll add up bank accounts, vehicles, personal belongings, boats, and trailers. And when we get to $100,000, we're going to say yes or put a check mark in that box. In the state of Idaho, if we can say yes to either one of these questions, our estates are required to go through a process called probate. <coughs> Who here has heard about probate? <laughs> right? Probate is simply just the legal procedure we go through after somebody has passed away to transfer their assets out of their individual name and into the name or names of other people. Mm -hmm. I like to lay the foundation for an estate planning or life planning conversation with what those two triggers or those two questions that the state's going to ask that will take us into a probate. Now whether we go into a probate or don't go into a probate, that's kind of another story, but I always like to say, okay, two triggers, real property, $100,000 or more. So probate uh, lasts anywhere between 12 and 18 months here in the state of Idaho. Again, it's just a statutory program that we go through. There's some mandatory waiting periods. There's some notice periods that we have to do. Most of us do not know how to go through a probate on our own, so we have to hire an attorney to help us do this. To hire an attorney for 12 to 18 months is pretty expensive. So I like to say on average, it costs us anywhere between about seven and $9,000 to go through a probate. Probates are 100% public. What I mean by that is we're required to file certain documents as we go through this court procedure. Every single document that we file with the court, anybody, regardless of their reason or their purpose, can go down to the court and get a copy of that document. Your next door neighbor. So, um, in addition to being public, uh, they are easily contested. So what I mean by that is because there's all this public information and we have to go through this court procedure, it's kind of a really welcoming environment for someone to step up and say, hey, Michelle just passed away. Well, I want to take a look at her will. And I don't think that that's what Michelle really wanted to say in her will. I think Michelle really wanted to give me some of her stuff. And so it really just kind of invites and opens the door for people to come in and contest our wishes or contest how our estate is being transferred. So what do we do? We create an estate plan. An estate plan is simply just there to make sure that we have an instruction manual. Our estate plan really does two things for us. It says who can speak for us after we've passed away, and then what do we do with all of your stuff? Typically when we create an estate plan, there's two main documents that complete that package, and that's going to be wills and trusts. Now, wills and trusts are very similar documents. Again, they're both legal documents that say who can speak for you after you've passed away and what do we do with all of your stuff, but it is how a will and how a trust are implemented that just make them very different documents. So when we create a will during our lifetime, we write down who can speak for us and what do we do, and then we put our wills aside. After we've passed away, the state is going to ask those two questions, and if we say yes to either one or to both, then we have to go to probate. The very first thing that we do in probate is we have to give your will to a judge so that it can be validated. What that really means is your will does not have any legal authority or validity until or unless a judge validates it in probate after you've passed away. So if you've ever heard about people's assets getting frozen or stuck after they've passed, that's that time difference between when somebody has passed away and then when a judge has actually validated their will, legally authorizing somebody to speak on their behalf so that their instruction manual can now begin to be followed. Interrupt me at any time. <laughs> How are we feeling about this? 
Does anyone have any questions? How do we avoid that? How do we avoid that? <laughs> trusts. Remember I said wills and trusts are very similar. A trust is also a document that says who can speak for you and what do we do with all of your stuff. But a trust, unlike a will, is never presented to a judge. A trust, unlike a will, does not have to be validated after we've passed away. And that's because a trust, unlike a will, has all the legal authority and validity that you need during your lifetime, but also immediately after you've passed, for the person that you've asked to speak on your behalf to start following your instruction manual and honoring your wishes. Because the best part about a trust is when we have a trust and it's properly funded, we are gonna bypass or prevent probate altogether. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. What was your question? The question was, what does it mean for a trust to be properly funded? So I promise I'm going to answer that. How many of us own properties in multiple states? Okay. So please remember when I said Idaho is going to ask those two questions. Any state that you have real property in is also going to ask similar questions. Every state that you own property in is going to ask if you own real property and if you say yes or put a check mark in that box for any state that you own property in, your state's going to probate. My record is I've had five probates opened at one time. That's the most that I've ever had is that we started a probate here in Idaho and there were four additional states that we had to open up probates in. So we create a trust and we make sure it's properly funded to make sure that we can bypass or prevent probates altogether. Okay. Okay. We ready? I think so. Next. She will answer the question. <laughs> okay, so earlier um, it, I was talking to you about um, the documentation that is in, in a state plan that allows you to have the flexibility with your real estate and also with your assets in particular. So how many of you are familiar with the power of attorney? Do you know how they work? Yeah, they're pretty fairly pretty straightforward. But in this section, I'm just gonna at least just to make sure for those that are not initiated what, what they actually are, how they work, and when they're effective, and when they actually lose their power. So the durable power of attorney, which is this one, um, this one has to do with you know, any money that you have, any title, anything uh, that is titled. So your signature card on your bank card, your retirement accounts to say that this is what um, is yours written down on a piece of paper, uh, your warranty deeds for the properties that you have in various places. These are all of, uh, for the general durable power of attorney. This is basically a permission slip that allows you to have that flexibility to have somebody else speak in your behalf or you to be able to speak in somebody else's behalf. So, it's, so basically a power of attorney is just a permission slip that says, look, when Michelle can't speak for herself, I've been given permission to speak in her behalf because she's on a vacation someplace and I want to buy this house. Well, I have her power of attorney so now I can buy the house because this power of attorney is basically Michelle standing there saying, I can do this. Make sense? Also, if something were to happen to Michelle, um, to where she couldn't speak for herself, I still have that power then to be able to help her with her situation, which we'll talk about that in just a moment. What is interesting for me, um, that I'll tell you in a, in a minute for um, this other one, this other healthcare power, power of attorney, is that there was kind of a shocking thing about not having a permission slip. So I'm gonna go into that as well. So this one you understand, this is what gives you that flexibility, whether the person is there, your partner, your business partner, or your spouse, so that you can actually sign, sign a document without them there, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a power of attorney, okay. This is called a healthcare power of attorney, and a healthcare power of attorney is necessary to speak for someone when they cannot speak for themselves. So, um, for example, somebody goes in a hospital, and they can't speak for themselves, they're in a coma. Well, somebody's got to be able to speak for them to give them the proper medical care that they need or to pull money out of their bank account so that things can be paid for, correct? So I did not know this, but I got thinking about this with my wife and I got thinking, well, I always thought that when uh, my wife went in the hospital and I, she wasn't able to speak for herself, I'm her husband, of course, I get to speak for her because all I have to do is go, doctor, I'm her husband, I'm going to tell you what treatment to give her. And guess what he says? I don't think so. But has anybody ever thought that while well, I'm married, my spouse can speak on my behalf? Yeah. 
So you can see why this is an important document to have for your health care concerns, right? Is you want to make sure that you have a power of attorney, which is the permission slip that enables you to speak on behalf of someone else. Burning question. Burning if question. If you don't have that health care power of attorney, who is speaking for you if you are incapacitated? That's a really, really good question. Do we want to answer that now or later? Yeah, so um, if we don't have a permission slip, and please remember powers of attorneys are our permission slips while we are alive. When right. we pass away, those documents or those powers go away. Yep. So we have our general durable for our, all of our legal, financial uh, stuff, and then we have our healthcare documents. If we don't have those permission slips, then what we have to do is we have to go to a judge and so I'm gonna use Doug again. So if something happened to Doug and he was unable or unwilling to speak for himself and he didn't have a permission slip for somebody to use, I would have to go to a judge and I'd have to say, hey judge, my name's Michelle. Doug can't speak for himself and the judge is gonna say, well Michelle, you look like a really nice person. I'm like, I am. Let me speak for Doug. <laughs> and he's gonna say, okay, I'm gonna grant you the power to speak for Doug. Now when he does that, the judge grants me the power to speak on Doug's behalf. It is so much more than a power of attorney. When I am granted this power by the judge, Doug actually loses his legal right to be himself. He cannot vote, he cannot carry a gun, he does not get to be him, I get to be Doug. That's called a guardianship or a conservatorship. I think we can all thank Britney Spears because she really gave us some like insight to what that guardianship or conservatorship can look like. So I get the powers from the judge, I get the permission slip from the judge to now go and speak on Doug's behalf. Doug gets better. He can speak for himself now. To be able to get his right to be able to speak for himself back, um, Doug has to go to a judge and he has to say, hey judge, I'm Doug, I'm better, I can speak for myself. And I'm there with him and I'm like, no, he can't judge. <laughs> and the judge is like, I agree with you. And I'm like, just let me be Doug. Not that the judge would do that. But to answer your question, if you don't have a permission slip, then what you have to do is go to a judge to get a permission slip. Can I think, anyone do that? Um, yes and no. I don't want to create unnecessary fear. Um, my husband and I, it's our second marriages, and so he has children, I have children. Without our permission slips, he has a 27-year-old son. If something happened to him, it's kind of a race to the courthouse, right? If his son beats me and says, hey, judge, I'm here, and my dad can't talk, he's like, yeah, you look like a great guy, you can be him. We see that a lot with family members, specifically in um, health care situations where somebody maybe um, is in a situation where they can't speak for themselves and then we'll get a parent that comes in over a spouse. I think it's really scary that most of us assume that because we're married our spouse is going to be the one that's allowed to speak for us. It's not always that person. So it's just really critical. I think powers of attorneys clearly they're my favorite documents. Mm -hmm. I'm really passionate about making sure that we have them in place. I very much care what happens after I've passed away. But even more so, I care what happens if I don't pass away. So if there's ever a moment that I'm not able to be myself, either legally or from a health perspective, I want to know with certainty who can speak for me and what they're going to say. I don't want to leave it up to chance. Yeah. Great questions. So again, because this is a life plan, this is something that we want to do while we're living. We want to be able to have the powers of attorney, to be able to flex, to do the things that we want to do, to invest where we want to invest, to move our money the way that we want to move our money. But then there is that eventuality when we are incapacitated. We also have that other document that says somebody else that knows what my goals are, what my values are, will be able to speak in my behalf and fulfill the um, investment dreams that I've had all along, right, to take care of my family. So let me just summarize uh, real quickly and just have the last slide and then we'll have some other questions. And that is this one. Basically, um, a comprehensive estate plan should have all of these elements in them. I know that we can, I don't know about other law firms, but I know that these are the things that we provide at eLegacy. And that is the revocable living trust, which is the trust that um, Michelle was talking about. And when I had mentioned a bucket, that's basically the bucket that everything kind of goes into. So it's necessary to pre prevent probate, as you can see. A will, um, again, you might not remember everything that you want to put into your bucket, you know, in your living trust, but your will will take care of that because it'll just pour over into it. But the most important thing about a will, especially for those that have children, is that it's necessary to name a guardian for your minor children. You've got to have that. So both the husband and the wife would have the will that's in this bucket as well. Okay. And then you have the general durable power of attorney, which we talked about. That was the money bags and the deed of trust. 
and then we have the health care power of attorney, um, and there are other health care directives that go along with that. We don't need to get into that at this particular point, but you've heard of a living will. That's one of those other documents that goes with that power of attorney. And then uh, somebody asked a question about the funding part of it. The deeds and the titles go into that bucket as well. So basically when you have a revocable living trust, so um, I am Doug Lutz, I'm no longer Doug Lutz, I am Doug Lutz Trust. And that's when my, my house is gonna be in Doug Lutz Trust that goes into the bucket. That's the deed, that's part of funding a trust. And then it's the same with your titles that have to do with your cars, your RVs, your signature cards on your bank accounts, etc. All those get retitled so that they are in the name of the trust and not in your own name. The living plan part of this is you get to go in and out of that bucket as much as you want. You can still use your bank accounts, you can still buy and sell, you can do whatever you want. Put stuff in the bucket, take stuff out of the bucket. But this is part of the comprehensive estate plan uh, that we provide at eLegacy. Michelle, did you want to add something to that? So I, I think one of the challenging pieces when you're creating your estate plan is it's really challenging to shop legal services, right? So what kind of an attorney? Uh, what is included? What should be included? So I think I'd just like to share that when you're looking to create an estate plan, work with an estate planning specialist. Attorneys and doctors are very similar in that We've got um, specialists when we go to a doctor, right? I would, would not go to a cardiologist um, or my general practitioner if I needed to see a cardiologist. Same thing when you're looking to have some legal work done. Go to an estate planning attorney. This is a very specialized area of law. Make sure that you have an estate planning attorney that's drafting your documents. Mm -hmm. Not all plans are created equal. So when we talk about having this comprehensive plan, I really like to think of it as this comprehensive life plan that's going to include a variation of all of these documents that you see up here. There are, yes. <laughs> I think we'll do ladies first. Yep. Uh, so when you put your deeds and so forth in the trust, is there any protection for liability? Great question. Mm -hmm. So the type of trust that we're talking about here today is called a revocable living trust. Like Doug was talking about, I call trust buckets. Okay, we're going to create an instruction manual, the piece of paper that says who can speak for you and what do we do with your stuff. But in addition to creating this piece of paper, we're going to create this giant bucket. And then we're going to take all of your stuff and we're going to put it inside the bucket. So like Doug was sharing, we're gonna take any real property that you own, and instead of Michelle Newby as an individual owning it, Michelle Newby's trust is now gonna own this piece of property. So remember, flash forward, when I passed away in the state of Idaho, it says, hey, did Michelle own property? No, no, she didn't, her trust did. And then all my other stuff is gonna be in the bucket, so did she have $100,000 or more worth of stuff? Nope, sure didn't, her bucket, her trust did. So Idaho says, wonderful, we don't have to go through probate. The person that I've asked to speak on my behalf is going to grab my instruction manual and because it's a trust, it automatically or instantly has all the legal authority and validity for them to start following my instructions and start passing out the contents of my bucket. Now what's really cool about a revocable living trust is during my lifetime, I'm going to do whatever I want with my stuff and my bucket. I can put stuff in, I can take stuff out, so if I buy and sell new properties, it's going to go in and out of my bucket. Because I can go in and out of my bucket, third party creditors can also go in and out of my bucket. There is no protection when we think about um, liability protection. Lenders in the room, do we care about revocable living trusts? Is it okay to go in and out of those buckets? Can you lend on those properties? Generally, they have to put them out and put them back in. Right? So it's okay. We don't get too crazy about do we have this or do we not have this. Uh, not only could we do a, a first or a mortgage on it, but typically, you know, pulling out equity is not an issue as well. Again, the concept that you can go in and out, there is no protection. Yep, and so it varies just a little bit from lender to lender, so I like to say for the most part, because you go in and out of your bucket, no one else cares, but it does not protect you. I have a question and then a statement from an insurance point of view. The question is, if you two aren't lawyers, how legal are these documents? So Doug and I aren't drafting these documents. 
Um, we didn't want Great to question. do a sales pitch here tonight. What we wanted to do is more of an educational piece about estate planning and overviews. We work with eLegacy Law. E-Legacy Law is an estate planning law firm. Our brick and mortar location is in Hayden, but we are a virtual law firm, so we have clients and attorney teams in all 50 states. Specifically speaking, when you work with E-Legacy Law, you work with a dedicated legal team of three, which consists of an estate planning attorney, a paralegal, and a client relations coordinator. So kind of circling back around to my point, when you are looking to have documents like this done, it's important that you're working with an estate planning attorney. I think you had a second. Excellent. Then the statement I have is related to if you own properties and you have a, a trust that you make sure your insurance company knows about that, mm -hmm. you're the client while you're still alive. But if you've let your insurance company know about the trust beforehand and it's listed on your insurance policy, then when you pass away immediately, uh, instantaneously, the trust is automatically the client and the property stays insured. Sorry, I'm bringing in the insurance thing. If you don't let That's your insurance company know that there's a trust involved, now we've got to go through the power of attorney and document changes, and, and it's possible that the policy goes lapses in the process, and I've seen some horrible things happen to properties that are vacant that, that are uninsured, so. Yeah, to, to John's point, Part of your whole estate planning is knowing what's going on with insurance, what's going on, you know, letting your tax accountant know what it is that you want to do so you can take advantage of your, um, all the uh, tax advantages that you can take care of. Also, a financial advisor if you have one, like uh, D.A. Davidson. I mean, that's what you've got here is a, a financial advisor that knows what's going on. What's cool about uh, a good estate plan and, and a good team is that everybody works together and reviews us, which by the way, I wanted to say when you have a comprehensive estate plan like this, it should be re reviewed at least once a year. And uh, we, we like to pride ourselves in talking about a, a three-legged stool to make sure that we talk behind our clients' backs to make sure that all tax advantages and all things that are necessary for their estate to be protected is actually taken care of when we meet with CPAs, FAs, and our, our legal team. So. Great. The funding, just really agents. quickly, the funding is, is a piece of what John is sharing. When I talk about a properly funded trust, not only are all of your deeds properly funded or titled into the trust, uh, but all of your other assets, but very importantly, your insurance policies, uh, your investments, everything needs to be properly what I call in your bucket. So that's that funding piece. And I saw a lot of hands. So, talk to us about a trustee. So, we have stuff set up where one of us passes, you know, property gets thrown into the trust, but then that person's not allowed to do anything with it the way I feel. And all these documents are written up or in language and I can't read because yeah. Laura and Blair. <laughs> I know. Are you afraid? <laughs> That's yes, right. and it's like douche. And then I feel like I gotta hire a lawyer yes. to get at what is should be really mine, right? yes. I feel like I'm paying someone half of what I have just to get a load at what I want. So talk to me about a trustee. Yeah, so a trustee is simply just the person who gets to hold on to your bucket. I'm going to really use this analogy of this trust, right? So when we create a revocable living trust, then during your lifetime, you're going to be what's called the grantor as well as the trustee. So you're holding on to the bucket. You could do whatever you want with your stuff. That is with a bucket that doesn't have a lid on it. There are some buckets that I'm gonna say have a lid on them. We create this trust, we create this giant bucket, we throw some stuff in it and then we put a lid on it. Now during our lifetime we can use and enjoy and benefit from anything that's inside of this bucket, but we can't go in and out of the bucket. So to your point, maybe I have this home in there, it's my home, I can live in it, I can use it, I can enjoy it, I can benefit, but if I wanted to sell it and buy something new and move to Florida, I can't sell it, it's got a lid on this bucket. So we wanna be really careful about what type of trust we have, and then who is wearing the hat of the trustee. So in the situation where we have a revocable living trust, we're in control, we're our own trustees, when we have what's called an irrevocable trust or a bucket with a lid on it, we are not allowed to be the trustees of those trusts. We have to pick somebody else to do that. So to your point, it sounds like um, that would be an irrevocable trust. Yes. 
during your lifetime you can use and enjoy and benefit from it, but there's some other third party called the trustee that's holding on to your bucket. So there's differences. There's different strategies when we create a comprehensive plan. There's different uses for each type of bucket, whether it has the lid on it or doesn't have a lid on it. There's a lot of strategy, conversation, and consideration that needs to be made when we're creating those buckets. Because the situation that you described, I would hate for any one of my clients to ever feel that way about their estate plan. Mm -hmm. It should never feel restrictive. It should never feel um, that you uh, can't understand it or that uh, you don't have access to your own stuff. So what is a family trust? Ah, yeah, okay. So remember trust, I, I'm gonna sound like a broken record and I hope it's okay, trusts are buckets, right? And so um, you could create as many buckets as you'd like and you can have all sorts of names for your buckets. And so we hear about family trusts and they're just really family buckets where we're gonna put some stuff in there that maybe we want a lot of people in our family to be able to use and enjoy and benefit from it. We have a lot of those here on the lake where we have these amazing lake homes that have been in families for generations. Now we don't want them to be in our individual names. So if Doug and I were brother and sister, like love your brother, but I'm not gonna own a home with you, right? Doug's irresponsible. If he gets sued, like they're gonna come and take this house away. But if we put it in a family trust, it does give us that protection. It gives us our instruction manual that says how we can use and enjoy and benefit and it provides us a really cool way for us to own this home together. So family trusts are just an extension of what we're talking about, but conceptually just a bucket where you can put stuff for your family so to use. Protect you from outside Most family trusts do, because that's the purpose of uh, wanting to create this trust, is to have that type of protection. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I've ignored you a couple of times, and I'm sorry. <laughs> So all law firms are just going to be a little bit different. Uh, most attorneys work off what's called an hourly rate. So you'll know your attorney's hourly rate that will be quoted up front. To Doug's point, we do not think these are set them and forget them documents. At least once a year is our rule of thumb. We want you to take it off the shelf, crack it open, and even if it's a five minute conversation to say nothing's changed, everything is good, talk to you next year. So um, it's typically an hourly rate to have your documents reviewed. There are some attorneys uh, like us here at eLegacy Law, we do flat fee pricing. Our flat fee pricing includes comprehensive plans, but it also includes uh, annual reviews. We don't charge our clients because we want our clients to call us, email us, or set a meeting when they have questions about their documents. Because again, we don't ever want our clients to feel that way about their documents. So it's gonna vary dependent upon what law firm or what attorney you're working with. A good estate planning attorney, just so we know hourly rates, are gonna be anywhere between about $350 and $650 per hour. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you cannot put in the bucket? Hmm. Yeah, there's some stuff that just can never go inside of the bucket. Think of an IRA, individual retirement account. Just by name alone, right? Your IRA has to be win your name. I can't separate it from me and put it into this bucket. I have to own it. So there are some assets that just can never go in there. We have like some. LLCs, all that stuff. Okay, so I'm stuck on this bucket thing. I hope that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Right. I'm, I'm a very, very visual person. I like to call LLCs, S Corps, uh, buckets as well, right? Um, a bucket, now we're going to get a little bit more legalese, is a separate legal entity outside of ourselves. A legal entity on a piece of paper, right? We're all just a name, a date of birth, and a social security number. Right? right? So we create these legal entities outside of ourselves, which I call buckets. So LLCs are separate legal entities. We would never actually take an LLC bucket and place it inside of a trust bucket. However, what we would do is you would own um, an LLC or you'd have ownership or shares in an LLC. And we could talk about your ownership within your trust. So there's two totally separate buckets but your ownership within the LLC could be addressed within your trust.
Yep. Poke a hole in it and then let it flow in. So I have a question about the trusses already. We keep saying we're multiple living trusses. And I'm wondering how can you grow it and what's the unrevocable version of the trusses? Yeah, great question. So I'm going to sum it up really easy again for those visual learners. A revocable living trust is a bucket without a lid on it, and an irrevocable trust is a bucket with a lid on it. Revocable means that during your lifetime, you guys are going to do whatever you want. Put stuff into your bucket, take stuff out of your bucket, rip up your instruction manual, change your instruction manual. You do whatever you want with your documents, your trust. An irrevocable trust, once we write it, and create the bucket and put the stuff in it and put the lid on it, it's a done deal. So you can't access anything? You can't take that lid off of that bucket and then you can't change the instruction manuals that you've put together. So basically it's like done. Pass and then <clears throat> into the trustees. Yep, you got it. I gotta know why would you do that? Oh, they're super cool. There's a lot of reasons why you would do an irrevocable bucket. I definitely think there's a time and a place for them and that's a really big conversation that in my opinion needs to be had with your attorney, your financial advisor, your tax um, strategist. strategist, advisor, your CPA, whoever's doing your taxes and I'd also include your insurance agent. So for me I would pull together those people. I'm looking at Nancy because as a financial advisor, you have to be in that conversation. And any attorney that would stick you into an irrevocable trust without talking to your financial advisor, I would say run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is it down to the instruction manual for the people that are inheriting that irrevocable trust to say when they begin to get access to that trust? Um, it is. There's some rules that you can do with the irrevocable. So now we're talking about the bucket with the lid on it. Um, so you've passed away. There's some other rules and laws that come into it. Eventually, the lid can be ripped off the bucket. Um, just think about it. If you're creating the trust, it just can't be during your lifetime. So are there financial benefits for having your stuff in the trust? The, um, for the, yeah, in the bucket. Yes. Uh, so, of course, um, hopefully you guys all have LLCs as I hear about investors and so we know that there's some tax advantages to creating an LLC and creating that sh separate legal entity. For a revocable living trust, please know there are not any tax benefits or consequences for creating a revocable living trust. Although I am creating a new name and a date of birth, I'm actually still using my own social security number when I create a revocable living trust and so I don't get any tax benefits from that. Now with that being said, there are some potential tax benefits to my beneficiaries through my revocable living trust if I live in a state that has some estate taxes, but Idaho is not one of those states. So if you created a revocable trust and your name right now is in your personal career, properties in your personal name, would you just do like a quick claim to your, yeah. to your trust? Don't have an empty bucket. <laughs> yeah. So what I mean by that is when you create a trust and you have this instruction manual, you actually have to put your stuff into your bucket or you have what's called an empty bucket. So if you have a trust and your deed, that piece of paper that's filed with the county who says who owns that property is still in your individual name, it's not in your bucket. Flash forward to when you pass away, the state of Idaho is going to say, hey, did Michelle own property? Yes, she did. Can you put your LLC into your bucket? So your LLC, um, if you were to create, let's, if I may answer it this way, if you were to create an LLC, that's a bucket, and then you have a rental property, I want you to do the same concept, take it out of your own name and put it into the name of the LLC. And that's what your deed with the county needs to say is the LLC's name. Not your individual name. The property is not in your trust though? No, the property is in the LLC bucket. Mm -hmm. And your ownership over that bucket is going to be talked about over here in your trust bucket. Okay. Right? And we draw <laughs> pictures. Yeah. I draw pictures yeah, for my clients all the time. And then I draw like houses and cars. There go the whiteboard, which we're not right? using, right? So. Like, which bucket are we in? So, how does asset protection come into play? If you have those LLCs in your LLC bucket, yes. but then your ownership is in your other bucket, yeah. something happens and somebody yeah. wants to sue you and take all your real estate or whatever, yeah. then they 
follow that line back and get into your trust bucket because it says you own part no. of the LLC? No, it's going to be the short and quick and dirty answer to that. So the question was about LLC and asset protection. We all know that when we create an LLC, we do that because we want to create a brick wall between Michelle Newby as an individual and Michelle Newby as an investor or a landlord, right? And so that's the protection that we're creating by creating that bucket and then placing our home or that property into the bucket. And so simply having a trust that talks about our shares or ownership is not going to break down that wall. So you still have your LLC liability protection. Okay. Yeah, great question. Yeah. This is so fun. I know it is. It is fun. Maybe this will help a little bit. Tax insurance set up ours. Yes. And our trust is the member of our LLC. That's a, a great yeah. example yeah, it's of a great example. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So a, a lot of fun stuff as you guys are thinking about, you know, investing, as you're thinking about making sure that you have the proper documents. Again, not all estate plans are created equally. Um, there are so many options out there. I think it's just really important to know what you're looking for and what should be included. When you do a trust, even though you have a trust in a bucket, you always, always, always have to have a will. Uh, not only does your will support as a backup to your trust, but for those of us who still have minor children at home, our will, never our trust or any other document, our will is the legal document that says who the guardian would be if we were not there. So if you got kids that are minors, you gotta have a will. Or if you have adult children that don't have a will and they have, you have grandchildren, you want to make sure they get that. Yeah, I, a friendly reminder too about powers of attorneys. Please remember when our babies turn 18, like we're not their people anymore. We don't just get to like bust through the door and be like, mom is here, I can speak for him. Um, as soon as you turn 18, you got to have that power of attorney that says who can speak for you. So I, I love to give powers of attorneys as like college gifts. It's like, oh, you're going away to college? Here, sign right here so I can speak for you in case, you know, I need to pay your bills or talk to your doctor because now that you're Or talk 18, to the school who won't talk yes. to me and yes. I'm paying the bills. <laughs> right? Yes, yes right? School, and you're like, do you want to get the check in the mail? Tell me how much it is. So, um, so when we think about those, um, I see a lot of empty buckets. So funding is a really big and um, important piece to me. Is what I see is a lot of attorneys will stop after you sign your document, and everyone's like, yeah, celebration! I have a trust. Okay, you do. You have a trust, but you got to put some stuff in your bucket now. And so it's just really important that you make sure that you properly transfer all of your assets over into your trust. And that's it. So do you recommend that you put vehicles in your trust? Our attorney said no. I know. Real estate, yes. Yeah. Accounts, yes. So remember two triggers, folks. Real property will take you to probate. So if it's dirt, it's going in your bucket. In the state of Idaho, which is what we're focusing on here today, it's $100,000 or more. So a lot of attorneys will say, you don't have to put your cars in your bucket. Listen, I'm an all-in kind of a girl. If I've got a bucket, it's going in. Especially nowadays with the cost of vehicles. So I pick on my parents and they've given me permission to do this. They live in Arizona and they created their bucket and they put their stuff in it. And last year they FaceTime me and they're like, look what we bought. And it's like this big house on wheel RV thing. And I'm like, whoa, cool. Um, is it in your bucket? Well, no, I forgot. And I'm like, here's the deal. I'm not gonna go to probate because you guys bought this house on wheels. Get it in your bucket, <laughs> right? Yeah. So $100,000 or more, that's why a lot of attorneys may say, don't worry about your vehicles. Prices of vehicles, my gosh. 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars all day long rolling down these roads, right? You've got one or two of those and a boat and a trailer. Huh, I'm going to probate. Now, his argument was uh, with the vehicles, if you get into an accident, it's in the trust name, it opens your trust up to the liability of the lawsuits. <laughs> So if I have a revocable living trust, remember it doesn't have a lid on it, so it's all in there anyways. Okay. There's no protection in there. 
Whether it's in service. Yeah, that's right. Yes, there you go. Talk to John Nishimoto. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody to go to probate for you've got yes. some things up. Yep. It's just those things that are not in the bucket. That's just the those about. things that are not in the bucket. You are 100% correct. Yeah. So if I've got all my dirt in the bucket and then I didn't put my vehicles, but then I add them all up, ding, $100,000. I'm going to probate because it has a title and I have to go to a judge and I have to get permission to say so and so passed away and I'm their person and then the judge has to give me a permission slip to go and transfer those vehicles. That's the only way you're gonna get that vehicle out of the decedent's name is going through probate. So is that the current worth or value of the vehicles <laughs> or is it what you paid for them? It's, it's <laughs> fair market value. So it's current where, where we are. Yeah. Is it $100,000 ever it can. It's up to our lawmakers. I mean, right now in Idaho, it's $100,000. Um, our friends in Oregon, it's $75,000. So you're going to see little changes or variances from state to state. And so uh, they may, I, yeah. Okay. yeah. If you're in New Jersey, it's 20000 Can the asset or can things with a mortgage go in there as well? So again, mortgages should not affect your ability to fund a revocable living trust. Because you can go in and out of your bucket, if you don't pay your mortgage, the company's just going to go right in and take it and walk right out with it. The VA will let you do that. No. The VA says no to that. Okay, and um, that's good to know. They say absolutely no. Nope, it's got to stay in your name. Right, so I'm just going to property anyway. <laughs> so I'm in there. I'm in there. You're in there, right? You're, in the, You're already in a bucket. You're in the wrong bucket. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Wow, that's so, funny. So my son, basically, he's he's just about to turn 21. He has a daughter, and but he doesn't own much more than the shirt on his back. So can he essentially, at this time in his life, get by with a, just a will? And you yes. know that covers his daughter and anything if something happens to him. Yes. And the few bucks he has in his pocket or whatever. Yes. Yeah. So, fun story and I'll keep it short. So, um, I think wills are really important. Remember, they say, who can speak for you after you've passed and what do we do with all of your stuff? If you do not have a will, what happens? Well, the great state of Idaho says, that's okay. Here, we're going to use this one. So, if you do not have a will, the state is going to give you one. So, we hear this a lot. Well, I'm 21. I don't have anything. Everything I own fits in my car. Why do I have to have a will? We had a client not too long ago, um, really young, everything he owned could fit into his car. He was in a car accident and he passed. It was a drunk driver uh, and there was a really large life insurance uh, settlement as a result of this um, accident. He did not have a will. His parents um, and him were not um, close. They actually hadn't been raising him since he was 15 and he had an old, older sibling that had taken care of him. The state's will said that the older sibling that was taking care of him for since he was 15 would get nothing from this settlement. The state's will said that the parents that he was estranged from would get everything from that. So even though we say, hey, Michelle, I don't have anything. I don't need an estate plan. I say, you do. You have people that you love and care for. That's what you have. So putting together an estate plan, the most uh, common misconception is it's for really wealthy estates. No, it's not. Not at all. Every single one of us, if we're 18 years or older, should have a will and should have those powers of attorneys. Well, especially for health care. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, it's really critical. Yeah. Yep. For everybody. Yep. So yeah, the, but, that knows who cares about you. Yes. Decisions yeah. Versus yeah. The yeah. Is, is the... Um, like that document, say you have all those documents, documents and they're lost in the room or something. Yeah. <laughs> is it the equivalent of not, they're not existing? Or is there a database where you can go like, hey, actually my attorney has that file? Like is it, it yeah, recorded publicly a year? It depends on who you work with, whether they have it or not. Some law firms have a digital database where you can always access them. Yeah. You have a password you can get in. Because if you're like traveling, you know, if something terrible happens, I don't have my 
<laughs> don't have my but, writer. But, but you, you raise a really good question because one of the most important things to do is when you do get your trust, you do get your documents, you, you immediately want to put them in a safe place so that you don't lose them. So if you don't have a safe, you can get one of those traveling safes. At least you know what it looks like. And oh, it's in that concrete thing, that briefcase that I carry around. But well, you, you want somebody that's close to you to know how to access it. There you go. Yes, I'm talking, you know, they know already, so they can go and get that and bring it to the hospital. But, like, so, if you're in an emergency situation, yes. you miss, you're not going to have time, oh, would you run to the states and grab Right, you're not going to become conscious all of a sudden to be like, by the way, my power yeah. of attorney is here. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right, you are my power of attorney because I can't speak yes. for myself. Right. right. So, um, so uh, a couple of pieces on that, I, I think that were, um, as you name your person, do not make that a surprise. Surprise! But nobody wants that surprise. So tell that person, hey, by the way, I have named you on this document. Maybe here's a copy of it. Here's something. So I'm a big proponent of do not make this a surprise. Mm -hmm. And make sure that they have an expert healthcare that they have a copy. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that they don't have to find it. They have it. So um, in addition to that, some states, Idaho is one of them, we can actually register our healthcare powers of attorneys. Yep, and our hospitals do that and they're integrated in uh, Coeur d'Alene as well. And so I'm like, pass those babies out. Like give one to your primary care physician, give one to Bonner General, like register it with Idaho. I, I say pass those things out. Um, for your will, you can actually register your will down um, at the courthouse. I'm not a big fan of doing that. And we actually recommend to our clients that you don't do that. Because remember, it's your instruction manual. It's not a set it and forget it. And we're gonna talk to you about it every year. And what we want is really clean and easy instructions. We don't want confusion. Well, is this document it or is this document it? And so we actually advise our clients not to register their wills with the court. Because what if you wanted to make a change? Then it's another step. So instead of registering it, we just say know where to keep it, and that is not in a safety deposit box at a bank, because they won't let your person into the box to get the document to show that you had permission to get into the box. So that's a no-no, don't put it in the safety deposit box bank, but um, a safe place in your home, an electronic copy, and I agree with uh, the woman in the back, give it to the people who are listed on there. Yeah. What's the, how does the stock fit in this plan? Yeah. Um, I know IRAs don't go in, what about stocks? Stocks can absolutely go in. Mm -hmm. Again, I think that's a really strong conversation that you have with your financial advisor. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, correct me, Nancy could speak to this so much better than I could, but it's somewhat beneficial too if you've got it into a trust or have a designated beneficiary or something, because stocks can be kind of chunky to move around if they were solely owned and then you've passed away. It can be tricky depending on the, the beneficiaries. If you get that stepped up, cost basis, yeah. just as in real estate, which is really nice. Yeah. And then it just depends on if you need to fund the estate to settle it or not. Mm -hmm. And then on the power of attorney, um, can you talk about the springing power of attorney? Uh, I have really struggled with those. Yes. I see so many attorneys write them and people don't understand what yes. they say. I, I'm right there with you. You're like a girl of my own heart. So powers of attorneys, again, are permission slips while we are alive that say who can speak for you if you cannot speak for yourself. It's your document, it's your permission slip, you can make it say whatever you want. So some people say, hey Doug, you can speak for me if mm -hmm. I'm incapacitated and three doctors have said so and my cousin also agrees and so on and so forth. Okay, cool. So then something happens to me and Doug's like, I got you, Michelle. I got my permission slip. And then he takes it over to someone and he hands it over. He's like, I'm Doug, I'm Michelle, I can speak for her. And they read it and they're like, no, you can't. I need five forms of ID. I need three letters from a doctor and I need, you know, your firstborn son. Cousin. Yes, cousin, right? So there's all these different clauses that we can put in. And the fear behind this, right, is it is a big deal to give somebody power of attorney. When I give you power of attorney, I'm saying you can be me. And you can walk into any place you want and be me, and it's just as good if I'm there being me. 
So again, picking on my parents, they've given me power of attorney. I could walk into the bank tomorrow and clear out their account. And the bank would be like, have a great day. And I'm like, you too. <laughs> so it's a big deal. You gotta be able to trust the person. So a lot of people say, whoa, I would never give anybody power of attorney over me. And I'm like, okay, when would you feel comfortable having somebody speak on your behalf? Well, if I was incapacitated and two doctors said so and so on and so forth. So we see attorneys draft in these clauses into these documents that really hold back that power. It's not right or wrong. I think you just need to know that you're in control to make your document say what you're comfortable making it say. And then again, it's so critical that you're working with an estate planning attorney who's a specialist, who's gonna be able to talk to you not only about what in the world does this document say and all this legalese, but how is it implemented? I have seen really beautifully drafted documents be so poorly implemented, and I've seen horrible documents like be implemented gorgeously. I'm like, whoa, how did that happen? So um, it's really important to know what permission you're giving and when you are giving it. No power of attorney is ever valid after somebody passes. Sorry, I get that a lot. People are like, my mom just passed, here's her power of attorney, and I just rip it up. And I'm like, what else do you have? <laughs> They're like, but I am a power of attorney, and I'm like, mm mm, that passed when she passed. You can only do what she can do if she's the longer. Great way to think of that. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a living document. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So who's excited to get an estate plan? Yeah. <laughs> So y'all are gonna say that we need to do this, right? I, I don't. I need to get this all in order, and then we're gonna walk away from this and just kind of completely forget it. So, if we can encourage you to do anything, at least if you have little ones, to really consider the will. Definitely consider getting your powers of attorney in place uh, for the reasons that we've already explained to you. So, how do we get a hold of you? Um, well, we'll leave our cards here and give you an opportunity to give us a call and. If you have more questions, be happy to answer them. So yeah, we do uh, um, complimentary consultations. Uh, not all attorneys do that, but a lot of attorneys do. So I recommend you know do your research as you're discussing and deciding. Really kind of look and see who's out there. Don't be afraid to you know interview a couple of attorneys. This is a pretty personal matter that you're going to be going through and having these conversations, and it really should be with the intention of building a relationship, hopefully for the rest of your life. So. Um, um, get out there, ask for consultations, um, see what's out there. Yeah. So if you have a will and a trust already set up, would it be cheaper just to start from scratch and go, I just want a consultation? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so fun fact about attorneys. Um, if you were to start with a new attorney that did not originally draft those documents, um, they would essentially just start all over again. So the reason being is anytime we take pen to paper, and even if we changed one word on that document, <laughs> we now, it's our document, we now own it. So you are going to be hard pressed to find an attorney, and if you do run, that would ever say, yeah, it's gonna be cheaper because you already have it in place, and all I have to do is change that word, so it's super cheap for you. Um, I, I don't know of one attorney that would ever do that. <laughs> so, um, Again, with the idea, hopefully, that you can establish a relationship. Uh, we charge a flat fee to do a comprehensive package. And then in the future, if we ever had to take pen to paper and make a change, we charge a flat fee for that as well. But it is significantly less than our original flat fee to create the documents. So if you can find an attorney that you love and like, then it's always going to be cheaper to take pen to paper later on. And you're going to love and like our legal team, so that's my shameless plug for, well. <laughs> you like said, this isn't a sales thing, it really is for education, but. Um, I was trying not to sell anything tonight. I know, tonight. But, <laughs> and she's so good at it, so she can tell on me. Um, not all, she said, not all law firms are created equally. A lot of law firms will do a tremendous job on this and never touch this. They'll make you do that. Our, our firm does help you and actually We'll, we'll do the deed work and all that. Um, we make sure it gets funded. We don't want you walking out with a trust that you're just gonna have to rip up because it was never funded. So that's the shameless plug for eLegacy. And the flat fee, so. Does it matter like if, if say we were working with your firm and we have our team of three and then the attorney that we're working with retires? Yeah. 
can somebody from another attorney from the firm just step in and take over those documents without having to redo stuff? Yes. yes. So that was uh, one of our strategies when we created and designed e-legacy law is that we really uh, bought into the succession planning. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of attorneys that just kind of hang a shingle out there, right? And they're incredible. But then they go away and the shingle comes down and then it's the bakery and you're like, I don't, who do I go to? So with e-legacy law, we have a really strong built-in succession plan. We've got strong attorney teams. And so if one of us just never came to work, you're not going to experience any um, difference within your service. It just may be a different attorney or it may be a different paralegal that comes in. But e-legacy will be there for you. That's great. Okay. So how many years has, has your team been together? Uh, 35 plus. We've got generational uh, leaders uh, within our co-founders, so it's a father and son co-founding team. And then within that, we've got generational planning and a lot of mentoring that we're doing with young attorneys, paralegals, and client relations coordinators. Uh, we are in all 50 states. And so that's another important piece is you're going to see variations in law, uh, specifically with taxes. So it's really incredibly important for multi-state owners that you have an attorney that's going to be able to support you in each state that you are in. So that's kind of a cool benefit of e-legacy as well, um, is that we have attorneys that specialize in all 50 states. Yeah. And you don't always have to have boots on the ground. It's like, dude, I can't meet. Oh, do you have Zoom? Yeah, I can do that. Can we do that? Yes, we can do that. And that's why we're a vir virtual um, legal team. So. And you guys just do that type of law, you don't do any other type of law, right? No other type of law. Yep. Estate planning is a little bit uh, deceiving just because it's a little bit more than just wills and trusts and powers of attorneys. It's also real estate law. It's also business formation and succession planning. It's also community property agreements, separate property agreements, prenuptial and postnuptial agreements. So it does kind of cover a really large area of law. Think transactional, but we are very specialized within just this area. Don't call us if you need us to go sue somebody for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>